That's good. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you found your way to this, uh, to this workshop. Um, the question always is like, workshop, what does it mean, like workshop? Um, so this is not like a course or a lecture or anything. So I will be talking, uh, but the, the, we hope that we will, at, uh, at the second half or so, that we will do an, uh, a discussion on, on, some, on some, some topics, how we do things. That is what this is about. So this is a workshop which I submitted uh, together with Anka Angela, who you heard talking in the previous hour a lot about uh, uh, Isan, about op uh, open science, and Peter Zellner, who is uh, uh, a research associate at uh, URAC uh, here at this, uh, at this institute. And, and we worked together in the past about, uh, about this topic. Um, so we're talking about reproducible and reusable remote sensing uh, workflows and, and what that means and, and how we do things, right? Um, and my name is my name is Edsel Pevisma, and I'm associated with the Institute for Geoinformatics uh, of the University of, uh, of Münster, and, and I'm a partner in the uh, OEMC uh, project. So um, we have I have been thinking a lot in the past uh, five or seven years or something like that about how we do science. Science we basically do science. With, uh, we write, you know, we do research and we write it down and we submit the research and, and a PDF or HTML file appears somewhere and then you go like and you look at all these e equations and you think what the hell was going on there, right? How did the person do this? And if there is something that you could use, you know, code or something data, then, then this is a very attractive thing. It just doesn't happen so much. Uh, I've also been thinking about uh, starting, a, starting a new journal called Reproducible Remote Sensing Papers, which is still in the starting phase, in the thinking phase, yeah? But the nice thing was that there, I found a lot of people who were uh, interested in, in participating in that in terms of being part of, an, uh, of a future editorial board. So this is still an idea that, that is in the air, which, which I might do. And, and so I've been writing a book now for the past six years, which is now finished. So in principle, I have no reasons to longer delay this, this idea. Um, we also did a long uh, time a project called Opening Reproducible Research, and we had a workshop uh, one and a half year ago, which was about uh, remote sensing and reproducibility, and we invited uh, an, a number of people. This was hybrid online and, and a number of people on site. Uh, Anka was also there and um, uh, looked at, at breakout sessions in small group, discussed like how relevant is reproducibility, what is the current status of reproducibility, and, and also sort of uh, discussing the idea of a new independent journal for reproducible remote sensing. How would that look like? What would be the positive effects? What would be benefits? What would be negative aspects and potential pitfalls and so on? To get an idea of sort of what lives in the, in the community. And, and uh, I, I would be happy to share uh, slides with what came out of that workshop with, with you if you're interested. Uh, but this is too long sort of to, to now uh, sort of go through. So this is just sort of uh, putting this out that this is not the first time that, that we're thinking about this or that we are uh, discussing this. Opening reproducible research looked at uh, integrating reproducible assets, so, so workflows, software and data uh, in the publication cycle, right? So in, in a system where you basically not just submit your PDF, uh, but also submit your notebook and your data, something like that, right? And that it would be sort of taken up in the in the publication cycle, in the review and in the publication. Um, what we found there, that was sort of, it looked, the project looked mostly at um, uh, a technical, we thought, you know, there is uh, the challenge of reproducibility is partly technical, partly social, and we looked at the technical challenges and we discovered that they were relatively easy to to uh, solve or to come with proposed solutions, uh, but that doesn't mean that those will be picked up. And it turns out that the sort of the more harder problem is uh, is a social problem. Um, and uh, I say it is the challenge to reproducibility is relatively easy. Uh, we heard from from Julia this morning that less than four percent of of these ten million uh, um, uh, Python node uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, run or are re reproducible. Which is, you know, which is relatively obvious because they didn't capture 
the whole thing, right? They didn't capture the code that was running. They captured just the syntax of the command that were being run, but not the environment in which it was executed originally and all the packages and all the dependencies that were there. So if you would do that, you basically, and that is what we uh, try to do in opening reproducible research, is capture this whole thing in a container, right? Container is sort of the sort of virtual machine that has the complete software environment and, and is runnable, right? Is, is runnable uh, again. So if you have everything like the software, our Python, Julia, whatever packages, the system requirements like GDAL versions and so on, the operating system and the data in the script notebooks, uh, then you could relatively easily do that with a, you know, with a certain guarantee in the hope that, that 10 years from now we can still run Docker images. But it is kind of, you know, that is relatively like Docker is not 10 years old already, but, but it's relatively likely that that will be possible somewhere. What is harder is, of course, if there is a large data set, if there are whatever gigabytes of, of, of or terabytes of data that you uh, put in there and that you cannot put in this, in this virtual machine, right? Or you could theoretically, but then you're not going to move that virtual machine. So it will be sort of that, that problem uh, is, is much harder. Um, of course, solutions there would be that you would work with smaller data sets and, and, and say, well, okay, here is the, 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 the challenge I did with my large data set. And if you want to run it on a smaller section of the data set, a small area or a low resolution of that data set, then you can do that. And that's a relatively confined thing that I, that I can give you to you, right? That fits in, in a GitHub repository or something like that, smaller than a gigabyte. So that would already be an enormous uh, gain to do that. Um, other things that are hard is software that cannot be controlled. Think of Google Earth Engine, think of RGIS, Erdos, closed source, Syn uh, Sentinel Hub, closed source software things, but also open source software that runs on dedicated hardware. So, uh, if you talk about climate scientists, weather modelers and so on, they say, well, you know, if my code is open, is there, but nobody can run it because it is this complex sort of cluster thing that it that it runs on this HPC thing that doesn't sort of run on your commodity uh, hardware, so to speak. So, so that those are other uh, borders that are not even don't even have to do with licenses of code. Um, but a discussion, I think, should take place there, right? So people uh, do write uh, Google Earth Engine scripts and share them and, and, and have the feeling that this is reproduced, that this is open science, this is reproducibility and so on. So, so there is, you know, some aspect, there are good aspects to that. And there are sort of, you know, iffy aspects to that, so to speak. And, and having that discussion is, I think, a good thing, right? So what are the critical things happening there that, that you would like to have open or, or that you would like to sort of independently verify? Um, so to what extent is this still open? So I, I think there are a good discussion uh, about, about these things. Uh, it, it would, be, would be useful and is not really happening as I see it. So what is also hard is actually to get someone to review your code and give you feedback. Yeah, so, so actually reproducible is really trivial. You do something and you ask somebody else to do that too based on, on what you created. Right? And this is something that in principle everyone can do. The problem is that if we submit things to journals, they don't have any requirements in terms of reproducibility. At maximum, as we heard yesterday in this room, they have uh, requirements about data, provision data availability and so on, but they will not enforce it. If you say, you know, send me an email, I will send you the data, then the editors are happy and they send it on and reviewers don't care, right? They will not send that email to the, right? They, it's, it's just not, that is not happening. Uh, the whole thing that's completely not happening is requiring scripts and so on. So I, I standard, it makes my life a lot easier. Uh, as if I get uh, papers on computational research and people clearly work with Python or with R or something like that, and they don't share the scripts, then I sort of reply to the editor, well, please ask the authors to share the scripts because this is useless if it's not shared, right? And then if it doesn't come, then I reject to review it. It makes life a lot easier if you think like that. Um, the easy thing you could do as an author is just ask somebody, right? If it's a colleague or somebody, a collaborator or somebody you know or something like that, would you like to run my code, review it and give me feedback? Simple thing. Yeah? And if you have done that, you could as well write it in a letter to the editor and say, well, here's the code and there it is. And we have a report from somebody who independently verified that this code worked for that person, right? So that helps the whole process. There are these things like run my code um, that, that happen that is that doesn't actually run your code it exists it's a it's, it's like a 
a GitHub where you can upload your script and your data and it gets something like a DOI and might be findable. The more useful thing is this code check idea that where Daniel Nust collaborated with, with Stephen Englund uh, from Oxford where they said, well, if you do this thing, ask, your, ask somebody to run it, uh, then you can use this code check, basically this button and, and say, somebody did this, right? And you can see here, for instance, in the GitHub issues, where the discussion was like how the code was improved after uh, doing that. And still an idea that's in the room is sort of could we or should we set up a journal just for this purpose, right? Sort of have these discussions and do these things sort of in addition to, to basically the scientific work that you share with the, the paper with the text and the equations, a, a paper or a short description about the code and the data that is reproducible, right? As a, as a different asset because it's a different activity of reviewing that. Somebody has to run it and typically reviewers of scientific papers are not willing to do that. Um, where is OpenEO in all this? So I'm, you know, one of the people behind OpenEO, which we started in 2016. A key motivation there was the ability to compare cloud-based platforms with each other. So the technical validation, we had all these sort of different platforms doing things. If, if, if you, so that nobody will compare two things because there is nobody who understands two things, right? So you either, nobody's comparing R with Python because you either understand R or you understand Python, right? So there's, very few people doing both. And it's the same thing with Sentinel Hub and Earth Engine and, and planetary computer. And so if you have sort of one interface to multiple uh, backends to multiple systems, then you can do the, at least a technical validation. Do they uh, all give the same result on the same uh, query? That would be good. Of course, if the query is nonsense and non-scientific, it's not a problem, but it's sort of it's just a technical validation. So it also gives us now the ability these days to use uh, backends locally to run your things using OpenEO infrastructure, basically play as if you're a backend, do things with small data sets on your local computer. Uh, harder it is to describe, to store, to advertise, as An Anka said earlier, to advertise, share, and find uh, assets that, that do this reproducibility. That, that thing in OpenEO is called a process graph, which is a, which is a JSON document, right? Which is, which is actually, I don't know if everyone you ever looked at it, but you're pretty, pretty terrible to look at. <laughs> so <laughs> I always say, you know, people say XML is human, re is, 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 is human readable. I don't agree with that. <laughs> so it's the same thing with JSON. It's, um, but nevertheless, they are, they are the key things, right? They go in and, and, and something goes out, a process happens. And so this is the key thing. Um, the question is, should we share that? Or should we like, like, it's like, if you look at the text of a Jupyter notebook, it's also JSON. You're also not going to do that or, or doing version management. Now GitHub will solve that for us, right? But their solution is closed source. Nice. Um, but, um, you know, that is also not files that you're going to look into. So uh, maybe the, the, the Jupyter or R or, or, or Python or whatever uh, uh, notebooks that led to this process graph are, are much more useful to share. Um, and and there, is, there is this thing in the web editor that you can actually, from a process graph, now create the the, the Python or the R code that, that actually does that. So it is, there's kind of a bi-directional thing between the, the readable script and the, the machine readable uh, JSON, the process graph. Uh, but anyway, sort of sharing this is not uh, trivial and sort of where we, where we would we do that. Um, then, so that was my part. So I'm now asking uh, Anka to share, to give a little bit. So I asked Anka sort of, what are more the concrete uh, things that ESA is, is working on on, uh, on doing uh, at, at this moment in terms of activities uh, that go in the direction of, uh, of reproducibility in remote sensing. So if you want to take over, sure. here it's this slide yeah. and the next one. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep it actually quite brief because m most of the things I've already presented in, in, uh, in my talk just before. Uh, but basically we are um, as I was mentioning, mentioning also earlier, we have been involved in um, developing several diver different independent solutions. So we have been funding a lot of various platforms that are implementing things in their own ways. So now we are confronted with the situation that we want to have uh, workflows that are reproducible across these multiple platforms. So how do we do that? So we're trying to, um, you know, find some, some way to address that. One, um, one solution that we are uh, looking into is open your process graphs. So that's um, 
one development, let's say, that we're, uh, that we're supporting. A second one is um, the application package run by, uh, in, the, in the OGC community, let's say, that is mostly based on CWL and Docker. Um, and um, we're kind of exploring now, where, where are those platforms where we can integrate, where we can uh, use these solutions? Are they compatible? What are the pitfalls? What are the challenges to do that? Uh, we're trying to, uh, OpenEO API is kind of now adopted by several different initiatives, including the Copernicus Era space ecosystem, so this makes it a lot more um, easy, let's say, to um, have a lot of uses and test cases and feedback from the community on whether, whether, whether things are working or not. Uh, with the application package, it's one solution that we're exploring in the, in the framework of this activity that's called Common Architecture, that now it's kind of rebranded into interoperable building blocks. Um, that uh, I think we just kicked off about a month ago, so the continuation of the activity. So this is also um, creating, let's say, the premise of um, bringing this solution into the community and trying to get feedback on whether or not it is it is adopted. So we're exploring right now what is what is uh, something that what is a solution that will be mostly picked up by the community. Um, one thing that we're particularly interested in is finding solutions that would actually work in the sense that the community would find it easy to work like that. And personally, I'm very close to the earth science community, so also with the, on the applications one, but mostly for the, for the earth scientists. And usually um, in this community, people are very much hands-on, so they really want to have control over the data, over the code that they do. Um, providing a lot of um, you know, black boxes and abstraction layers is not something that they dislike, but it's not something that they're particularly, um, particularly used to. So for this community, the, uh, let's say the big challenge for us is how do we um, encourage this community to do their code in such a way that it is potentially reproducible, so that is eventually somebody could take this, optimize it, maybe even work together with a scientist to optimize that code into, into a form that can be eventually either packaged or transposed into an open your process graph so that it can be run independently also by somebody who's not necessarily an scientist but is interested in just having another run of that geophysical product because the group that is initially has initially produced it is no longer working on that. So how can we, if I, if I want to you know, re, uh, have another uh, global product of, of a particular kind, but it's only available for, I don't know, uh, 2020, and I'm now in 2028, can I rerun that and just have, you know, the whole time series because I just want to work with that? So this is a question that we have. Um, we are um, discussing with um, several um, journals, so AGU and our system uh, ESSD, uh, our system uh, data journal, um, to understand if there could be some mechanism that would facilitate also, um, let's say, the life of scientists so that if they prepare their data and their code in such a way that it is indeed fair and open and it, it really applies those principles, that it makes it easy for them to publish in one of these journals. Um, because it's a data journal that has a specific requirement or because it's a journal that just um, pushes for open science, pushes for reproducibility. So if you uh, work from the start with these principles in mind, you get an easy publication, let's say. So this is one idea. Uh, the, um, the, let's say some of the challenges that we're already confronted with uh, in this conversation is this works. And for example, for journals such as ESSD, the requirement is you need to make your data available at one click away. Well, this doesn't work if you are working on the cloud. <laughs> this doesn't work if you make a, a global data set. And this doesn't work for, for many, in many scenarios, right? It works if, when you have a very self-contained data that you can just push somewhere into a repository. Um, so this is a, a big open question. I hope that some people here in the room might have answers to how we can approach uh, this, type of, this type of things. Yeah. I would just end it here. Okay. I don't know if I have something Great. else here. No, I think that's okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, and then I would ask uh, Peter to give us uh, a view on, on how things work in practice at, at Eurek when, when doing these things. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Peter. I'm working here at Eurek. We're hosting the, um, this conference, so we're happy that you're all here. And yeah, maybe now we transition a little bit from, let's say, the 
the conceptual part of open science and reproducibility, then how ESA sees it to somebody who's actually using it in everyday life. So I'm just a researcher in the um, Earth Observation Group here that's led by Alex and a lot of my colleagues are here as well in the room, so I speak uh, also in their name. And I think um, one thing that we try to apply in our research group is on the one hand side we have open science and this is a little bit more shifted toward um, reproducibility now. So, but I think what is common to the both of them and what is important um, when using it every day is that you have time available to actually do this. So, whoever is writing out projects, they should be aware that you need time to implement open science, that you need time to create reproducible code. Um, I think slowly now this is getting into a lot of projects and it is required and there are time budgets, but I think it's also something that has to get really into the minds of uh, the leaders of research groups and so on. That is one thing and how we live that at Eurac um, as a specific example, um, not only in our research group, but in whole Europe we have an open science office that um, contains a couple of people that are actually only there to help you with open science questions. So if you don't know how to use Zenodo or you don't think maybe Zenodo is not the best repository to publish my data, you can go there and ask them. So that's a really nice help that we have here and also shows that the whole institution here is valuing uh, open science. That is one thing. The other thing that we have um, now in place is that we can register DOIs to the data sets that we provide. So we have the environmental data platform here in-house. We're maintaining that and if we put a data set up there, be it vector, be it raster, whatever, we can register a DOI with it so we can make it citable for the outside world and make it findable. So that's also really great that we have that opportunity here in-house. Um, we are developing and contributing to open platforms um, within Eurac. So that is, for example, the Alpine Drought Observatory that is completely open source and is completely open to everybody and updated on a daily basis. We spend a whole lot of time in maintaining that and as I said, um, making everything open source, putting the licenses, putting the DOIs on all the data sets. So that was a huge effort and took at least as much time as the creation of the indices has taken. Um, then furthermore, we're contributing to projects like OpenEO, OpenEO Platform, um, which are of course funded um, projects. And everything we do anyway is open source since we're, since we're a non-for-profit um, organization. And we have some, yeah, we're also investing into training um, opportunities like the MOOC that Anka has already mentioned. We're developing together with ESA that is how to do open science on EO cloud platforms. So these are, let's say, the things that we do in the open science direction is quite a lot and I think we're also specializing a little bit in that direction. Um, then specifically on reproducibility, um, I think the papers that we publish as a research group, since we're not only we're not only the group of advanced computing and earth observation, but we also have a snow group, a hydrology group, vegetation group. Um, yeah, there I think it's still work in progress to really convince everybody that it um, has a benefit of doing it. So that's, I think, what has been mentioned before. That's like the change in thinking about these things. And it's a, yeah, just a matter of communication and making it as easy as possible. And also giving a lot of incentives to the users or to the potential users um, to actually do that. So they should not be punished or it shouldn't be only the time that they invest. They should also somehow get a benefit out of it. Because when you work in a project like OpenEO, you get a benefit out of developing it. So I think also somehow we need to incentivize the users to also get a benefit out of using it and actively contributing to that. Um, that is one thing. Um, and then for reproducibility, I think the most important thing that we are currently doing is um, in OpenEO, we are in the, so there's the OpenEO platform and the OpenEO API definition and you can um, yeah, implement the backend of the API however you want, you can use GDA, you can use Python, R, whatever you want to do. But as a user, when you want to use it, you don't have control of what is happening to your data cube. Like you say, you, I want to resample this, I want to get this um, extent of the data, but it's not always possible for you to track down what is actually happening in this process graph that you're doing, or at least you would always have to send a request to the back end and have some, something going on on a cloud somewhere until you get the data back. So we're also involved in working on the client side processing that you actually have a little backend that you can deploy or install a library and get a small data set from the beginning of your workflow and then you can trace really what is actually happening to my data cube. So I think that is probably the most important thing that we're currently contributing to in terms of reproducibility um, of workflows. Yeah, and I think uh, that's what we are currently doing and 
that was uh, my point of view of um, how we're living this in everyday life. And yeah, I think with that we can open the discussion. And Good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so that was basically our input, what we wanted to share. And um, oh, I was hoping for more slides, but there are no more slides. Um, the, um, so the discussion, um, so we, you know, you may have questions, any questions that you, that you want to, uh, that you want to raise. Uh, one thing that, that I, that, that sort of, that, that crossed my mind, what Peter said, the sharing things, writing things that are shareable takes time. Yeah. It costs something. If you, if you write software, if you write a script or anything for yourself to get the job done, right. It's one thing. And then for, for, well, for your later self or for somebody else to, you know, for somebody to share, it is kind of, you look at things, oh, somebody's going to read it, right? So, <laughs> um, so you have to, right, you have to rethink and, and maybe do it a little bit more uh, in such a way that the intention becomes clear, which is also good for your later self, but, but also good for, for, for the community and for how people will look at you at sort of how do you work. Um, so that takes time. Uh, having said that, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, research happens, for instance, in PhD projects, which in, in my case, my university, uh, and so you need to write a couple of papers there. The, the thing is that you can basically, since, since the journals are, are moving so slowly, and, and a lot of journals, by, by the way, also are very expensive to publish in, so maybe you don't, you don't really want it. Uh, you can think of sort of writing the scientific part, as I said, the text and the equations to, to one journal and, and writing sort of an, an, a reproducible part as another publishable asset, right? Just as sometimes you develop software and you write a software paper because the software is useful to share. There are all kinds of journals, journal of open source software, journal of statistical software, journal of open research software. There's just a handful of these journals. They are typically uh, even free and, and open access and so on and, uh, and run by volunteers, Indi run independently from the from the journal. So, so that was where the thinking came from, sort of those activities that for the remote sensing community, this may be also something that is valuable because, uh, you know, the MDPI remote sensing journal doesn't care, you know, doesn't care about your, that, that there's a URL with your, uh, with your, uh, you know, with your Python notebook and, and the reviewers will not look at it, right? They will say, oh, nice. Yeah. So it's not sort of that, that communication is not really working. So that would be my, that is my broader question, like, like, would there be uh, interest for, for that? Would you sort of think about uh, using such an, uh, a publication outlet, given that it would be run uh, independently and, uh, and so not come with article processing charges? Um, and um, the, at least those are the requirements that I put on things because I don't like the publishing industry. Um, and given that sometimes the reviews take some time because people actually need to look at code and, and run it. So there's this sort of, it is a different review than just, you know, a 10 page paper where you start reading the introduction and you blah, 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 and you think, oh yeah, this is, this is okay. Yeah, this is okay, right? So it's, you need to, to get your hands dirt, dirty for reviewing things. Yeah. Julia. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. If you're maybe aware of some of the discussions in the publication world or in, the, in sciences in general. So because the challenge with reproducible research is that it's not at the moment, it's still not like the goal, right? The goal is to publish. And so as long as um, the, 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 um, the, the publisher doesn't require it, then it's nice to have. But then I always have to think, well, do I go the extra mile? And this is actually a long extra mile <laughs> um, to do, to, to make everything reproducible. And so my question is, are there some incentives or are this discussions already to, to actually make reproducible research to incentivize it? And so then to see more and more people doing it. And then at some point it, it needs to become a, Necessity, right? Yeah. So yeah, my so my my view on that is basically that in in our PhD regulations it says that cumulative PhDs have to have three papers, you know, which is nice. Other countries have four papers, 
And one of these papers can be a reproducible, reproducibility study of another paper, right? So you have the science paper and you have another. So this becomes a publication on its own. This could become a publication on its own. Like uh, if you look at the Journal of Open Source Software, I, I always mix them up. I think the Journal of Open Source Software, they were really, they're often one pagers. The papers are one pagers and they just come with the software in a short description but not, not a long introduction and sort of comparison to everything. And so this is just there and useful and it's published and it's a DUI and it's a publication. So extremely short papers, the writing is very short. Of course, the software can be considerable and that took time, but anyway, that needed to be written to do the science, right? So it is similar in that, in that context. Yeah, so you, 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 you make the reproducibility work a publication on its own and then it fits in the existing system. I'm also unhappy with the existing system, uh, but it's a trick. It's basically a trick. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. At least that's how I see it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had uh, one addition also to what Peter re said regarding our activities, which might also be important uh, for the sake of reproducibility, and that is the being active in the development of standards and, and participating to this. That's something we have not yet discussed here, at least today. One of the things that we do right now is actually working on bringing both Stack and OpenEO as community standards into the OGC. That is one way of doing it is, which is a little bit different from the classical OGC standards because these community standards are basically standards and specifications that have not been developed inside OGC, but they have first created a community and become the standard by the fact that people are using them uh, as opposed to first having a specification and then hoping for people to adopt them. Um, that's maybe also something we have to consider how we, how we deal with these standards because we have these two different worlds, somewhat things that come from the community uh, another issue that we have there, which we maybe also want to discuss, is that the standardization process takes time and the speed of development of new solutions is sometimes faster than you can standardize things. So that's definitely also an, an issue that inhibits reproducibility because by the time you have standardized and brought some things to the same level, there are already new things out there that people jump on and then you're losing interoperability and reproducibility again for that reason. Um, but it's definitely also something to look in. For me, this year at least, it's a personal kind of uh, experiment to see how this works out in OGC. I'm also co-chairing now this new standards working group on Geodata Cubes. Um, but I ha also have to see that's a, a medium painful experience to, to go through there and, and uh, really bring things forward. Um, but still, I think we should think about this and engage with these communities. Uh, I think the next level would be to be more technical if you go to ISO and bring something through there. Uh, and that brings also the issue of openness of standards, because some of these things that are standardized there, then the specifications, they're not really open. So that's also something that you need to push for, because for some of these documents, you actually have to pay in order to download the, spec the specs for these. Uh, and that's maybe also something we, we want to push for. In the case of the ones that we are responsible in OGC, we pushed for that these are open standards, but that's a choice that everyone who brings these standards in is, is making. So not all of them are readily accessible if you're not a member of OGC and even more if you're not a manager, member of ISO. Yeah, good points. So anyone wants to comment on that or a different comment? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I also have a question and comment related to um, the standardization and the, the code testing process. And there, what I'm curious about, and I have a background in software engineering, but I've not been doing it actively for a while. Um, I wonder if all parts of the code, if you have a big um, um, piece of software, are relevant for the peer review, because there might be only those bits that represent the model or the scientific inquiry that are actually crucial for science. If we speak about open science now, maybe we can get inspiration from um, back in the day when you'd had uh, when you had um, interfaces and, and just a question of interoperability of testing the interface for the generic parts and only have the scientifically relevant part actually peer reviewed that would reduce the workload maybe a lot maybe some parts could be 
automize. Yeah, I, in terms of my experience with with the the, the the software review, actually that that happens is that it is it is relatively shallow. Mm. Yeah. So if you look at sort of we all uh, agree on using higher and higher level scripting languages because we want to abstract away all the details, like all the details, like how is the cloud optimized, GeoTIFF in bits and bytes organized, and, and is the reader correct in putting the right bit at a, and co decoding it right and so on. So we don't go there, right? Mm. But we could, right? If there was a problem, we could. And problems now and then occur, and you go, somebody's going to sort out what happened, right? Because this, it's not good. And so it, you can scrutinize it. And I think that is the main, that is the main thing. We're not, not everyone is constantly doing that. It's constantly looking at the complete software stack and reviewing all that. Now you look at the essential things and you assume, you make a lot of assumptions that particular thing that everyone uses all the time just work, right? And you look at then certain things like, uh, yeah, why is this done like this? And you look at it in detail and so on. And you say, no, this is not right. Yeah, so there was a join. It should have been a left join. It is a, it is a whatever, right join or something, right? Yeah, I mean... So, so that is, I, that, it's just, you cannot do that. It's not going, there's so much lines of code. I didn't mean like all the abstractions that we leave away with frameworks coming up. But like, um, if you have a piece of software, where there's a lot of input, output and stuff that is really scientifically not the most relevant for a peer review, yeah, that, yeah. that was so, just one yeah. comment. And then I was curious to learn if, like, how are um, data sets uniquely identified and, and certified that we may be able to work with um, certificates and just re referencing them um, yeah. from our packed containers? Yeah. That is also a very good question. Um, and and we this is was one of the motivation, one of the things we ran into in the Open Air project that when you do the same process, send it to different sort of environments, you figure out at some stage that particular data sets have been normalized in different ways. Yeah, so that, and then you look at, okay, you know, it's, there's these differences, and then you figure out, okay, yeah, that is something to take care of, right, in some way. So, so you also learn these things, that there are, there are differences that happen that are not so well known or not well documented, or, but happen nevertheless. So these are these are very important. And these activities and comparisons and so on uh, bring these things to the light. Yeah, there is very little certification in in Earth observation in in a sense of uh, as you would do it with with whatever medical uh, machinery or something medical devices. Um, maybe talking about the reproducibility of some. Of code, there's something I might rather disagree with on one of your first slides, where you said that it's like kind of easy to reproduce the code in, like I don't know, in a Conda environment or with pip installer. Or so because there's still no, like no, no, no. I said a container. Okay. I said a container that contains everything, the whole software stack, okay. from the operating system to to everything. Okay, because that's, that's what I meant. That's why I want, want to mention uh, Nix OS or the Nix package manager because it's sort of solved. Uh, problem because they actually reproduce byte by byte like everything like that is contained in the environment and this would be like I think um, a really good addition to this kind of workflow if we had like all the code um, in Nix and there's also um, very recently uh, the GeoNix um, yeah, team they, they teamed up and uh, maintain all these packages so this, this would really be like a good initiative I think. Is that language specific? Uh, no it's agnostic. Okay. Like, it's yeah. really agnostic. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a type of container. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a container. Yeah. yeah. Felix had a question down there in the back. Um, yes, so up to now we talked a lot about the downstream reproducibility of uh, what the scientists can do, but you also talked about 10 years from now. So um, what would happen if the um, data providers like ESA change the algorithms or um, change the data products. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it is extremely important. And this has happened also in the past 10 years, I think, with, uh, with MODIS archives or something like that, that USGS says, OK, now you have version 3, now you have version 4, and some kind of new recalibration algorithm was applied. And the numbers have slightly changed, not dramatically, but slightly changed. So, 
So that is not like here is version 3, there is version 4. There, no, modus is now at version 4, something like that. So it's just replaced because it's so big, right? So those kind of things uh, happen. And, and that is, of course, right? You're, you're lost there. This is my, my hard to do the, for number one, large data sets that you cannot grab and isolate and put together with your code in an isolated place where it's not going to move, right? You, it's not, it's, you cannot, in yes, many cases, you cannot do that. And this is the same thing with climate data, of course, right? If somebody updates the CMIP6, whatever uh, cube of, of something, then yes, then you can redo the research and, and, and get a different result. Yeah. But is ESA thinking about um, versioning the, the algorithms program. and the platforms for producing the so uh, there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of thinking here <laughs> because there have been a lot of you know um, redistribution of new collections reprocessing and so forth um, there is I know that there is a very big conversation taking place in the context of the Copernicus data space ecosystem and um, so that's one I, I'm not sure how they will approach this but this is definitely going on and it's being taken into account the one thing that we are exploring and working very closely also with uh, our colleagues in NASA is whether there is an opportunity with some of the Sentinel uh, next generation missions to uh, make the, let's say, the, the, the official processors open source, some of those, so that the community can um, have access to the processor and basically regenerate the data as they need, uh, basically being, being um, making it possible to um, generate data using you know the previous version of the of the processor so that you can compare with historical data but this is all conversation in uh, like ongoing conversation so um, right now we're i guess we're still collecting requirements from the community on this thanks one last question before we move to the next sorry it's going there Thank you. Sorry, Mohammed. <laughs> I took a last. Yeah. Hi. So, um, yeah, it's yeah slightly related with reproducibility. Not really how to make it software or, or dataset reproducible, but maybe a side aspect of it. So, in our internal discussions here at URAC about yeah how to implement fairness and open science in general, we were sometimes wondering. So, what should be considered um, a fair like digital object in this? whole pipeline of things so we are using open EO, you know and like for example yeah the 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 processes graphs uh which anyway then you mentioned that maybe it's not the best way to express a workflow uh, i also agree that jsons are not really <laughs> human readable but so yeah we were wondering what, what and what are the trade-offs to uh select the thing to be to be converted to a digital object with a persistent identifier so for example the input data set of course but should the process graph be assigned also a, a digital a persistent identifier should intermediate um, yeah yeah it, it stopped right. i'm going to stop anyway so i'm um yeah no that is a good point so where on which assets should you put doe's digital object identifiers yeah. um I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly. I, I think, as I said, I think that the, the process graph is useful, but not as a communication means, right? So it is, in any case, sort of together with the with the client work, right? With the Python script or R script or Julia script that created it, you would have them. You would want to have both the one as human readable. The other ones was created from that and is recreatable, of course, if you have the same client version. And, and whether you put those on one or on both. Um, yeah, this, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think both both are of value, right? Yeah, yeah I think. Okay, yeah. thank you. Good, Thanks. nice comment. Good comment.